prosecutors on the circuit until one of them ended up in a body bag, the other facing a murder charge. Diane Diamond has the story of the pumped-up princess who was charged with killing Mr. California. It's no secret that as human beings, we have less control over who we become than we think. We are born to parents we didn't choose, raised in an environment we didn't choose, and are placed on a predestined path with the odds of deviating from that path highly against us. Who we are to become and the way our lives turn out is heavily influenced by the factors we can't control. This is a notion and a theme I want you to keep in the back of your mind when you think about Sally McNeil. Sally Dempsey was born in Allentown, Pennsylvania on September 30th, 1960 to her father, Richard Dell Dempsey, and her mother, whose name is unknown. Sally's father was an alcoholic who, when drunk, would go into violent rages and abuse her mother, something that Sally had to witness at a very young age. When she was three years old, her mother remarried and had two other daughters, Jill and Judy. According to Sally, her stepfather was not very fond of her and favored his own children. Like her biological father, he was also physically abusive to her and her mother. Domestic violence was so frequent in Sally's home life growing up that she believed it to be common in every household. Sally's neighborhood was also very diverse and gave her exposure to a lot of different people. Unlike many other of the white kids in her neighborhood, she never cared about the stigma behind interacting with kids of other races. In fact, her childhood best friend was black. She attended Deer Up High School in Allentown where she sought out sports as an outlet and she absolutely excelled. She participated on her high school swimming, diving, and track and field teams, and was noted as having been the best at everything she did. After her high school career ended, she enrolled at East Stroudsburg University of Pennsylvania, formerly known as East Stroudsburg State College. She went with the intention of getting her degree to become a gym teacher and was progressing very well in attaining that goal. However, after three and a half years there, she could no longer afford to fund her college education and had no choice but to drop out. With her aspiration derailed and barely making enough money to support herself, she was left with very few options. So she turned to another career that had a relatively low barrier of entry with a high career ceiling, the military. What you end up with is a Marine. Maybe you can be one of us, the few, the proud, the Marines. Sally, just like her brother and her uncle, served in the United States Marine Corps and was stationed at Camp Pendleton where she eventually worked her way to the rank of sergeant and primarily worked as a cook. With the military allowing for close bonds between service members and Sally's growth in her career, it was only a matter of time before she would meet someone and settle down. While Sally was a recruit at Paris Island, she had met Anthony Loden and the two would hit it off. Their relationship progressed to the point where they got married and eventually had three kids together. However, over time, the couple's marriage devolved to a point where they would abuse each other, something that Sally was all too familiar with. As she was being transferred to Camp Pendleton, she'd file for divorce from Anthony, and when the divorce proceedings were over, she would gain custody of their two children, Shantina and John. Now, at this point in her life, Sally had made it her mission to build as strong of a physique as possible in order to be able to adequately protect herself. Combine that with the rigorous physical requirements of the military helping her stay in peak physical condition and she realized at some point that she had developed a very impressive physique. With the support of her superiors, she took her physique to a competitive level when she competed at the NPC US Armed Services Physique Championships on Valentine's Day 1987 and took fourth place, validating the idea that she was meant to be a bodybuilder. And like every other bodybuilder, this revelation was all it took for Sally to fall in love with bodybuilding and explore her potential. Also like many other bodybuilders, it would take another person with a similar love and dedication for the craft to be a compatible romantic match, and this man was Ray McNeil. Sally had met Ray at Camp Pendleton in 1987 when they were introduced by a mutual friend due to their common interest in bodybuilding, and she describes their first encounter as lust at first sight. Sally was highly impressed by Ray's physique as he was with hers. It would be a very quick turnaround from their meeting to their eventual marriage, two months approximately. And this marriage happened right after the divorce from her first husband was finalized. Three years later in 1990, she competed at the US Armed Services Championships again and won first in the middleweight division and the overall alongside Ray who won his class as well. They became the first husband and wife duo in the NPC to win their respective categories. They seemed like a power couple. Being able to bond over their shared passion of bodybuilding and both being service members, it seemed like Sally had found her person. He treated her with respect and was willing to be present in her kids' lives. He was going to be the one that broke her abusive cycle, until he wasn't. 
Having bypassed the phase of truly getting to know each other, it was inevitable that there would be aspects of Ray's personality that Sally couldn't have known about. This combined with the fact that two months of knowing someone tells you little to nothing about them and it was clear that Sally truly had no idea who she was marrying. However, she would get a better idea of that very soon after the marriage. According to Sally, it would only be three days into the marriage before Ray began physically abusing not only her, but her kids as well, sometimes making one of her kids watch as the other one gets beat. She recalls an incident on base when Ray punched her in the face and she reported him to her first sergeant who sent her to medical where she reported the incident. Ray was then sent to the brig but was eventually released and upon his release, he would assault Sally worse than before as not just punishment for having him arrested but as a way to coerce her into dropping the charges. Her previous psychological conditioning of abuse had subconsciously formed Sally into an abusive person herself, something which she didn't necessarily choose to be but her environment made her. She had left one abusive marriage just to end up in another and the emotional toll that was slowly taking on Sally projected into her career and the innocent people around her. In 1990, she was demoted from the rank of sergeant for a consistently poor behavioral record. The Marines hold members with a high rank to a high standard as they should. However, Sally was not behaving in a way that reflected her rank. She struggled heavily to control her anger. She was violent towards her peers, lashed out at others, and this would be the beginning of the end for her military career. Early on in her marriage to Ray, the family moved to Oceanside, California. Having two kids to help raise and financing two bodybuilding careers, Sally now had her back against the wall and had to figure out what more she could do to support her family. The only thing she had that could create any sort of lucrative opportunity for her was her physique. A physique which for a female at the time was very taboo outside the sport of bodybuilding. Something which to outsiders might have been weird or embarrassing, but to Sally was an opportunity. She realized that there was an appeal for highly muscular women and a secret fantasy among men for that specific aesthetic. This was called muscle worship, also known as stenognia. What is muscle worship? Well, muscle worship is often when a client, you know, they want to see the results. So for a client wants to watch me work out, pump my muscles, so they can get an idea of exactly how they might look when we're finished. This is a sexual arousal from displaying muscles, which became something that Sally was eventually introduced to, and she would quickly capitalize on it. 120 pounds for 10 reps. So just think what I can do to your neck. Bodybuilder Sally McNeil may be only five foot three and 155 pounds, but Sally is no weakling. Do you know how strong I am? She began a career where she wrestled men and women on video for $300 an hour, which if we consider inflation from 1990, would come out to $686.69 an hour in 2023. She had initially been wrestling for other men before she decided to start her own company called Top Secret Production, where she produced her own movies. This increased her opportunity for revenue because she was not only wrestling men who would pay her, but also record herself doing so, satisfying both the worshipper and anyone else who would be watching the video. Ray was aware of this career and actually okay with it because of how much money she was bringing in. This career as this muscular dominatrix birthed the nickname Killer Sally, which she dubbed herself while portraying a character in one of her films. She had progressed to a point where she was even doing private sessions with wealthy men. At this point, she had become the main breadwinner of the family, so much so that Ray was able to leave the Marines to focus all of his time and energy on his bodybuilding career. Having found a niche that she could make a legitimate career out of, Sally seemed to be destined for a successful and lucrative post-military life. However, that didn't mask the dark cloud that was cast over her emotionally. It didn't mask the demons that she was fighting every day. What didn't help matters were the fact that her children, specifically her daughter, was mortified by what her mom was doing. In 1990, she was arrested for brandishing a firearm at her first husband, Anthony, and smashing the windows of his car with a metal bar. This incident, however, was not her first arrest. She had previously been arrested for assaulting a mailman who put hands on her son over a dispute between their two children. Ray, having left the Marine Corps in 1991 to focus on bodybuilding, as he and Sally agreed on, understood what he needed to do if he was going to maximize his career. So he started to increase his steroid usage, which combined with his already violent and abusive personality would not bode well for Sally or her children as he began to abuse them even more. Sally claims that it was the steroids that were the primary factor in Ray's violent behavior, but also acknowledges that she would go out of her way, specifically all the way to Tijuana, Mexico, to buy more steroids to support Ray's career. She would often bring her children with her, which she admits was a lapse in judgment. Now, it's important to note that while steroids have long been known to cause the people who abuse them to have increased sporadic emotions, particularly when it comes to anger, the steroids aren't likely to cause a loving, emotionally stable person to morph into a violent domestic abuser. It's the effects of the steroid abuse combined with the person's mental state that can exacerbate its worst effects. 
According to Sally, Ray believed that his career was much more important than hers, likely due to the disparity in popularity between men and women's bodybuilding and the fact that he was the bigger name in the industry. He felt that he was entitled to most of the drugs they had and most of the food that Sally bought for the house would go to Ray, with herself and the children having to eat what was left. Despite the abuse she was enduring at home, her support of Ray's career was paying off. In 1991, he won the heavyweight division and the overall at the NPC California Championships. He then went on to win the IFBB North American Championships in the same year, beating bodybuilding legend Paul Dillette and earning his pro card in the process. Ray has ambitions to become a new kind of pro. I want to set a new trend if possible, you know. I want to be as big as Lee Haney and as drift as Rennell as I did. <laughs> no question as to who would claim the right to become a professional. The complete package that was Ray McNeil walked away with the crown. Showing that bodybuilding is a sport for the whole family, his two children climbed on stage to flex next to Dad, the duly crowned North American champion. For American Muscle, I'm John Kobach. Sally, on the other hand, had competed at the 1991 Junior USA Championships where she placed 5th in the lightweight division and the NPC National Championships where she placed 13th in the middleweight division. Coming off of a disappointing placing at the biggest show of her career, she tried to gain some momentum at a smaller show but ended up placing 4th at the Palm Spring Classic. In 1992, she had the busiest season of her career when she competed at Junior USA's again and improved to 2nd place from her previous placing but only moved up 1 spot to 12th at the NPC National Championships. She continued to try her luck at turning pro like Ray but finished 9th at the 1992 IFBB North Americans. She ended her 1992 season with a 5th place finish at the NPC USA Championships and she would leave the Marines very soon after. By 1993, Ray had 2 years of improving his physique before he felt ready to compete at the 1993 Mr. Olympia. He entered that show and placed 15th out of a 22 competitor lineup, something which made him secretly irate due to how insecure he was with himself. And unfortunately for Sally, she would be the target of that anger. Sally not having achieved similar success to her husband in their shared discipline was something that probably affected her, considering she was very limited in the degree that she could enhance herself due to Ray's control over their resources. His behavior aside, however, there was another aspect to Ray's personality that Sally would eventually learn about, his infidelity. Ray was said to have not been faithful to Sally, continuously dating other women behind her back, something which she'd learn about over time. There was even an incident where Sally attacked a girl that Ray was involved with at an NPC bodybuilding show, pinning her to the floor and beating on her repeatedly. Because of this, she was suspended by the NPC for one year. However, what was more alarming than the assault itself was the intent behind it. Sally wanted to disfigure the woman so bad to a point where no man would ever want her. Ray's affairs were said to be a significant source of their fights and her growing resentment towards him. Around this time, Ray had also begun a pro wrestling career and dabbled in stand-up comedy, performing at free shows. To pull his weight in supporting the family, Ray also worked as a bouncer at a nightclub. On a night that he was working, he got into a violent altercation with a man where he stuck his fingers through the man's eyes, not in them, through them, blinding him. This was according to Ray's friend, Dwayne DJ Jeffers, and was also corroborated by Shantina, who recalls Ray coming home the night in question with blood on his hands, saying that he did what he did because his life was in danger and the others were trying to kill him. It was also around this time that one of Sally's fellow competitors in the bodybuilding industry would die from intimate partner violence, specifically strangulation. Something that was present in her dynamic with Ray. It was clear that Ray and Sally's propensities for violence not just to other people but towards each other was a radioactive combination that if left unchecked could possibly result in her death. Something which she kept in the back of her mind. This was likely the reason why she would often warn him about the shotgun that they had in their bedroom and how she wasn't afraid to use it. After all, they did have a previous encounter where she pulled a gun on him and the police were called which resulted in her getting pepper sprayed. However, having never been in or given an example of what a healthy dynamic is supposed to look like, she was a prisoner to her own predestined path, a path which she was set on when she endured the abuse of the men in her life at a young age. An experience which birthed the demons that she had been dealing with her whole life. In 1993, she was confronted at a club by a bouncer for dancing on the table when she was not supposed to. She responded by kicking the bouncer in the face multiple times and having the police called on her. When the police arrived, she threatened to kill them. With her suspension ended, she tried her luck once again at a pro card in 1994, not being able to nab a win. Her best finish that year was at the USA Championships where she would finish 5th place again. At this point, Ray and Sally had agreed that he would become her coach and mentor in the sport. The stress of pursuing a pro card in any discipline is stressful enough for most people. 
Combine that with raising children and an abusive partner in charge of your career who's also unfaithful, and you have a ticking time bomb that can be set off at any given moment, and it would be on Valentine's Day 1995 that it would explode. Here are the events leading up to that day. Ray had been having an affair with a woman named Marianne who he met at Gold's Gym. According to his friend Dwayne, he was very fond of her, so much so that he told Dwayne that he was going to leave Sally for her. So their relationship would progress, and at a certain point, Sally would find out about the other woman. February 14th, 1995. It's 9.15pm, and Ray had just returned home from a Valentine's Day date, but it wasn't with Sally, it was with Marianne. Instead, Sally was in their apartment wondering where her husband possibly could have been on Valentine's Day night, but she already had a good idea. Infuriated by the fact that Ray had been on a date with another woman on Valentine's Day, Sally began verbally abusing and berating him. She accused him of adultery and having been with someone else. The argument, however, didn't escalate until she began making fun of Ray's physique, which was a sensitive subject for him. Given the fact that Ray was an already violent man who abused steroids and dealt with body dysmorphia that many bodybuilders do, this type of insult would have surely set him off. And it did. The following sequence of events is Sally McNeil's account to the police. After confronting Ray, he slaps her and then pushes her on the ground. He then begins choking her as she tries to fight him off. During the struggle, she manages to escape his grasp, and once free, she runs straight to their bedroom to grab the very shotgun that she mentioned she would use on him in the past. She loads it with run round before making her way back to Ray. Once in the kitchen, she confronts Ray with a gun, who she explains is cooking food at this point. She asks him to leave the apartment, and he not only refuses but charges at Sally, so she shoots him twice, once in the abdomen, and then once in the face. After she shoots him the first time, he apparently asks her, why did you shoot me? Before she fires the second round, sending him to the ground. She calls 911, telling the dispatcher that she shot her husband because he was beating her up. And during the 911 call, you can hear Shantina screaming in the background. The 911 transcript goes as follows. I just shot my husband because he just beat me up. She'd repeat this a couple more times. You shot your husband? Yes, I'm at 1802 South Tremont Street. Who's crying? My daughter. Okay, is he dead? He's shot. Okay, what's your name? My name is Sally McNeil. Don't touch the door, Shantina. How old is he? He might beat me up. Ma'am. Sally would place a blanket over Ray's body to prevent the shock of seeing him laying there. Her daughter also recalls hearing her choke just before the first gunshot went off. Before police arrive, she hands the gun to a neighbor to show that she is no longer a threat and is promptly arrested and held on a $100,000 bond. Sally McNeil looked distraught as she was led into a Vista courtroom to face charges that she murdered her husband. Ray McNeil was a champion bodybuilder and a rising star. Sally McNeil was also a bodybuilder. Ray McNeil was killed by two shotgun blasts Tuesday night, and Sally McNeil told police it was self-defense. Her lawyer entered a plea of not guilty said the couple's long history of domestic violence and even a restraining order would weigh heavily in her defense. Ray was taken to the hospital where he would die from his injuries the next day. He was said to have had five anabolic compounds in his system and was three days out from his next show. The story made national news and shook the bodybuilding industry to its core, and as the trial began, many would be watching. Sally pled not guilty by reason of self-defense as her and her attorney would explore a psychological condition called battered woman syndrome. This syndrome is defined as a pattern of symptoms displayed by women who are victims of intimate partner violence from their male partners, partners who make them feel trapped, oppressed, and in a constant fight for their lives. A constant fight that causes some of them to lash out in defense, something which did have legal precedence at the time. It's important to note that battered woman syndrome is classified in the ICD-9 as battered person syndrome, but is not yet in the DSM-5. Now, Sally's defense team leaned heavily on the idea that she was a battered woman and did everything in their power to paint an accurate picture of the abuse that she had suffered at the hands of Ray. Considering the fact that this was a murder trial and Sally was fighting for her freedom, perception of the jury would be everything. They had her stop training and wear baggier clothing to make her appear more fragile and more unimposing than she actually was. As previously mentioned, the aesthetic and lifestyle of a female as muscular as Sally was one that many were quick to judge so the defense couldn't let the jury believe that she could fight back. They couldn't allow them to believe that just because she was physically strong enough to hold her own, that she was mentally capable of doing the same. With a plan set in place, Sally and her legal team had a fighting chance to win the case. This was until Sally decided to testify. 
a decision which her lawyer strongly advised against. This decision was based on her wanting to be able to tell her account of the years of abuse and trauma that she had dealt with, something which may have seemed like a good idea at the time but ultimately caused her defense to implode for a few reasons. For starters, the prosecutor on the case was highly skilled and successful at getting convictions and would surely pick Sally apart during cross-examination. Her military background didn't help matters as she was conditioned to answer questions with yes sir and no sir, and to make matters worse, she did this with little to no emotion. Her stoic nature when describing her abuse was not the demeanor that the jury was expecting from a battered woman. It came off cold and apathetic and ultimately did not resonate with them. Not to mention, the prosecutor highlighted the years of violent behavior and arrests in her past and brought up her discharge from the military for poor behavior. The nickname Killer Sally was also brought up by the prosecution as a means of proving that she was very aware and proud of her violent reputation and even asserted that she marketed herself as a legitimate and proud killer. The defendant is anything but a battered woman. Um, she, uh, she's one of the most violent people that I've ever prosecuted. and. Uh, calling her uh, suffering from battered woman syndrome is, is the abuse excuse. As if taking the stand wasn't bad enough, evidence would surface that proved that Sally's version of events was questionable to say the least. The first piece of evidence that pokes a hole in her story is the way she claimed to kill Ray. The shotgun that she used fired a single round at a time. Sally, if you recall her version of events, claims that she loaded one round into the shotgun when she went to retrieve it. However, she shot Ray twice where he stood and then called the police. So was it possible that she loaded two rounds and had a momentary lapse when talking to the police? No, because what detectives found when investigating the crime scene was a slug shell in the bedroom. This crucial piece of evidence indicates that the shotgun had been cleared after having already been fired, which means that for a slug shell to be in the bedroom, Sally would have had to shoot Ray, go back to the bedroom to clear the gun, which would discharge a shell, load it again, and then shoot him one more time. Now, you may be wondering why Ray hadn't made an attempt to leave the apartment if he still had the strength to stand after the first shot. Well, it's because he wasn't standing. If you recall Sally's version of events, the second shot that hit Ray in the face was fired while he was still standing, and that shot sent him to the ground. But the blood spatter analyst on the scene determined that based on the trajectory of one of the bullets that hit him, combined with the angle of the blood spatter found on their living room lamp, he had to have already been lying down while at least one of the bullets hit him, meaning that he was either standing and fell after the first shot or he was lying down for both shots. But regardless of the scenario that you accept, the evidence strongly asserts that Ray McNeil was executed. Now, this is crucial as it weakens the narrative that she was defending herself. After all, she said that he was cooking when she returned with a shotgun. Oh, wait a second. In 1995, McNeil took out a 12-gauge shotgun and shot her husband as he was cooking in the kitchen. When detectives arrived on the scene, his body was actually in the living room and not in the kitchen, which means that Sally's self-defense claim is heavily flawed. Even if his body was found in the kitchen supporting Sally's story, she did say that he was cooking, which in that scenario would mean that Ray likely wasn't an active threat to her if he was focused on another task. But the most damning piece of evidence, the smoking gun that destroyed Sally's self-defense claim, was DNA. Sally's DNA was not found anywhere on Ray. Considering her assertion that he assaulted her that night, the lack of DNA evidence to corroborate that assault was highly alarming, and at that point, her case for self-defense was all but gone. Shantina did say that she saw scratch marks on her mother's neck the night that Ray was killed, and said that those scratch marks came from Ray choking her. But that would never be proven. So, the likely sequence of events that the jury was left with was the following. Ray comes home after a night out with another woman, which enrages Sally and initiates an argument. Having been abused by him was something that she tolerated, but being left for someone else after all he put her through was something she simply would not allow. In a fit of rage, she grabs the shotgun, returns to Ray, shoots him as he's laying down. She goes back to the bedroom, clears the slug, loads another round, and returns to the living room to finish the job, and as a final f*** you, shoots him in the face. We the jury, the deep of entitled cause, find the defendant, Sally Marie McNeil, not guilty of the crime of first degree murder in violation. She sobbed, but then her face froze as the verdict continued. We the jury, the deep of entitled cause, find the defendant, Sally Marie McNeil, guilty of the crime of second degree murder. In March of 1996, Sally McNeil was convicted of second degree murder and sentenced to 19 years to life in prison. 
she had a lousy life, particularly her two marriages and so forth. And, and it was our opinion that uh, most or all of the battering was provoked by her. She was very aggressive. But when you read the law on murder, um, just because you're abused or slapped, it doesn't give you the right to kill somebody unless your life is in danger. And we came to the conclusion that, you know, she had many other options other than to murder him. Sally McNeil was led out of the courtroom, this time in handcuffs. She could get 15 years to life. Carol Hassan, KFMB News 8. While serving her time, she made numerous requests for parole on many different grounds, including improper jury instructions. The Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals overturned her conviction. This was then taken to the Supreme Court by the state of California, which reversed the overturn and reinstated her original conviction. During one of her parole hearings, she would confirm that the scratch marks that Shantina thought were left by Ray were actually the results of a wrestling shoot that she had days prior. She'd remain in prison for 25 years and was eventually released in 2020. With her children grown and no place to go, she temporarily spent time at a veterans transitional center which helps veterans reintegrate into society after prison. Here, she would meet her current husband and they would move to Northern California to settle and build out the rest of their lives. She also reconnected with her children, Shantina and John, and began building a relationship with her grandkids. She's currently 60 years old and asserts that her biggest mistake was not doing enough to protect her children. In November of 2022, Netflix would release a three-episode series on the life of Sally McNeil titled Killer Sally. The documentary was met with relatively good public perception. It featured stories from friends and family, Sally McNeil, and her adult children. Her son John went on to say in the documentary that Ray was the devil and he hated him. Unlike many other true crime documentaries, the story is told from Sally's point of view, making her somewhat of an unreliable narrator. She agreed to that role in the documentary because she feels like she hasn't been able to tell her side of the story. She also acknowledges that her memory is not the best, so it's up to the viewer to decide whether they're willing to accept her account or not. The documentary was well made and spent a good amount of time highlighting Sally's life and upbringing from her lens. Many other people made appearances to balance and counteract her narrative. The documentary also made it evident that the media coverage of the case downplayed Sally's identity as a victim by sensationalizing the murder as well as Sally's bodybuilder status and wrestling exploits. So in a way, during the media coverage, the real Sally McNeil was washed away under the sea of media scrutiny and headline bait. One of the biggest takeaways from the documentary, if not the biggest takeaway, was that Shantina and John were just as much as victims as Sally was. Despite the extent of their physical abuse not being touched on as much as the physical abuse of their mother, what's highly evident about Shantina and John is that the trauma that they had to endure, not just by witnessing their mother's beatings, but witnessing the murder of their stepfather, was something that no child should ever have to be a part of. The footage of them consoling their mother in the interrogation room was absolutely heartbreaking. And it was heartbreaking for two reasons. The first reason being, they never asked to be in that situation. They just wanted to be children, but unfortunately had to experience a traumatic life event that changed them for the rest of their lives. What happened to Shantina and John as a result of their parents' actions was not fair. But the second reason why that footage was so heartbreaking was the level of composure that they managed to have while talking to their mother in that situation under that kind of duress was actually very impressive. But the fact that it was impressive is actually what makes it so heartbreaking because that just speaks to how normalized that kind of trauma was for them. Because having found out what happened to their stepfather, despite all of the overwhelming emotions that they were probably feeling, they still managed to give their mother some hope about a positive outcome at the impending trial, which says that this was an outcome that unfortunately, they were probably not surprised by. Sally McNeil is a woman whose violent and abusive upbringing made her a product of her environment and set her on a predestined path that would draw her to violence whether she was perpetrating that violence or receiving it herself. The demons that followed her made her a reflection of what she's dealt with, which was certainly exacerbated by her steroid usage. However, she was a victim of incessant domestic violence. And like many victims, there's only so much that one can take. But in the case of Sally McNeil, one can make the argument that justice was served because even though she had to defend herself against her husband in the past, the evidence does prove that at least on that night, self-defense was likely not the case.
If you made it to the end of this video, thank you so much for taking the time to watch. This video is the first in a series of true crime documentaries in bodybuilding and the overall fitness space that I want to cover on this channel and I hope to have done this case justice in the way that I told the story, but most importantly, I hope you are entertained in the process. I'd also like to give a massive thank you to Mark Kara who gave me my first super thanks on YouTube. Let me know your thoughts on everything that I presented in this video and your thoughts on the case of Sally McNeil in general. I'm Large Kofi. Thank you for watching.